I'm going to preach today a prophetic message. And when I say prophetic, I mean it is thus saith the Lord. God is speaking to the church today. And 99% of the time, the disobedient and rebellious church is not going to like what the Spirit of the Lord has to say. And I highly doubt that today is going to be much different. Amen. I've got a feeling a lot of people aren't going to like what I'm saying today, but those of us who are sincere in our walk with God, I think we're going to leave this service grateful that somebody in the church at least had the guts to say what needed to be said. I want to talk to us today on the topic of the fickle fate of feckless fundamentalists. <laughs> it's a tongue twister. The fickle fate of feckless fundamentalists. If you'll join me in Mark chapter 14, the first 15 verses. Mark chapter 14, verses 1 through 15. The King James text today reads, And straightway in the morning the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council and bound Jesus and carried him away and delivered him to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answering said unto them, Thou sayest it. And the chief priests accused him of many things. But he answering said unto them, Thou sayest it. Excuse me, but he answered nothing. And Pilate asked him again, saying, Answerest thou nothing? Behold how many things they witness against thee. But Jesus yet answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. Now at the feast, at that feast, he released unto them one prisoner whomsoever they desired. And there was one named Barabbas, which lay bound with them that had made insurrection with him, who had committed murder in the insurrection. I would point out today, Barabbas led an insurrection. It was not successful. It failed. He was in jail. But that does not mean that they had not engaged in an insurrection. At least that's what the Word of God tells us. Now listen. Verse 8. Actually, let me repeat verse 7. And there was one named Barabbas, which lay bound with them that had made insurrection with him, who had committed murder in the insurrection. And the multitude crying aloud began to desire him, meaning Pilate, to do as he had ever done unto them. But Pilate answered them, saying, Will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? For he knew, Pilate knew, that the chief priests had delivered him for envy. But the chief priests moved the people that he should rather release Barabbas unto them. And Pilate answered and said again unto them, What will ye then that I shall do unto him whom ye call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him! Then Pilate said unto them, Why? What evil hath he done? And they cried out the more exceedingly, Crucify him! 
And so Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. The fickle fate of feckless fundamentalists. If you bow your heads with me a moment, Master, Lord, I know this today is a word for the entire church of the living God universal, those at the centermost of your church as well as those who lie at the outmost boundaries. Master, today, how we need a prophetic word from heaven, how we need the Holy Ghost to speak through your leadership, your God called men and women to declare the truth of God. Lord, our nation is in trouble. Oh, Master, today, how we need revival, how we need a move of God, how we need the church to correct its course. Anoint today, O oh God, your messenger, but more importantly, anoint the ear of every hearer. There are those today, God, bound by the spirit of blindness, bound by the spirit of deception. And in the name of Jesus, upon the authority of God's word, I command the scales to fall from their eyes. If there be any seed of sincerity in their heart, let them today hear and receive what the Spirit of God would speak unto the church. Touch us, help us. Lift us up to new heights and deeper depths than you than we've ever before known. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Many people who are not students of history, not careful, serious students of history, are unaware of the fact that during the rise of Adolf Hitler, in Nazi Germany at the uh, early part of the 1930s, the Christian community in Germany was wholly and fully unreservedly behind the Nazi agenda. They embraced the anti-Semitism, they embraced the xenophobia, they embraced the culture wars that Adolf Hitler preached. Many of them embraced the notion that Adolf Hitler, listen to me children, was on a Christian mission. Now some hearing this who have not studied history may doubt my words. But it is a fact of history. The evangelical Christian community in Germany was wholly behind Hitler. There were some who stood in opposition, but they were few. I read today from an article, Evangelicals for Adolf, Christians in Hitler's Germany by Ralph Allen Smith from Theophilus. Theopolis uh, website. It is an essay, and I'm just going to read a few uh, paragraphs. Christian compromise with Nazi Germany's political leadership is well documented in painful detail. There was resistance, but it was the exception rather than the rule. German Christianity was terribly timid. Leadership lacked spiritual strength because of serious biblical ignorance and unbelief. But it was not just the leaders. Christians in Germany, Protestants, even more than Catholics, not only cooperated with the Third Reich, 
A large percentage even celebrated it. There are reasons, of course, for the Germans in the 1930s resenting the resolution of World War I and the policies of the Weimar Republic, and they are not entirely illegitimate. Christians also bought into the National Socialist Program for supposedly Christian reasons. Hitler knew how to appeal to the underlying dissatisfaction to gain his place at the head of a new Germany. In his book, Backing Hitler, Consent, consent and Coercion in Nazi Germany, Robert Gelatelli uh, notes Hitler's policy of obtaining Christian support. And I quote now from this man's book, Hitler also reached out to opponents like the Catholics by signing a concordant with the Vatican on 8th of July 1933. Until then, Catholic voters were loyal to their center party, and it was they who were mainly responsible for denying the Nazis their electoral majorities. Catholics soon adjusted to the dictatorship. Protestants, however, were more sympathetic to Nazism all along. In their church elections of 1933, two-thirds of the voters supported the German Christian sect that wanted to integrate Nazism and Christianity and to expel Jews who had converted to prostitutes to Protestantism. Hitler made a brief radio appeal to Protestants on the eve of these church elections and asked them to show their support for Nazi policies. He could not have been disappointed by the pro-Nazi results. A website called Church and State an article, How Christians Gave Hitler Power, by Dr. Mike McGee. And Dr. McGee writes, Typically Christian, the Christian majority of the Weimar Republic had never been happy with a secular republic. By the early 1930s, roughly two-thirds of German Christians repeatedly voted for candidates who promised to overthrow democracy. Protestants had given the Nazi party its main backing leading up to 1933, being more likely to vote for right-wing parties because... They had no right-wing party of their own, unlike the Catholics. Evangelical youth was especially pro-Nazi. Ninety percent of Protestant university theologians supported the Nazis. Protestant pastors defended Nazi murders of traitors to the Volk from the pulpit. Considerable numbers of individual clergymen viewed the growth of fascism with suspicion. That is true. But anti-fascist Protestants found themselves marginalized and their reservations did not stop the favorable policies of church institutions themselves. Those who turned to outright criticism of fascism made their last appeals from the death cell. Hitler had a plan to unite the evangelical sects, S-E-C-T-S, but though many pastors Nazified, the plan failed because the evangelicals could always find incompatible differences 
in their Christian beliefs. It showed Hitler did not always get his own way. Pastor, why have you read that to us today? I'm trying to show you how fickle the faith of feckless fundamentalists can be. When you have no integrity, when you preach a message but you have no interest in living the message that you preach, it is very easy to fall into a very dangerous state of mind in a very dangerous place. In our current political environment, the realities of the fundamentalist movement have been laid bare for all the world to see. I've been preaching for decades that those who identify as fundamentalist Christians are deceitful twisters of God's word. They always have been. But thankfully now, in our current political environment, more and more people are suddenly beginning to realize this. They first establish for themselves doctrines which suit them. And then they seek out to twist and pervert the writings of God's sacred text to make it say what they have already determined it ought to say. Now, I grew up within the fundamentalist movement. And while I grew up within this movement myself, I came to this realization as I finally began to honestly examine my own theological practices and methods of Bible study. I came to realize, Tommy, years and years and years ago, I, I, I began to look at the way we studied and the way we approached the Word of God and I realized that everything was based on the notion of here's our statement of faith assemblies of God now make the Bible support this statement of faith that's how you do it people go to their pastor for answers because they read passages that don't quite mesh with their belief system and the pastor offers some screwball explanation and they accept it. At least the high churches as they are called filled with pageantry and unbiblical theology will readily and openly admit that much of their belief systems are based solely upon tradition. They make no bones about it. They do not seek to deceive or to be coy, but rather they say openly, this practice is born of tradition and not at all extracted from the writing of God's word. Fundamentalists, on the other hand, will tell you that all they believe is strictly derived from the pages of God's word and tradition has no place in their teaching. Yet the reality is a great portion of their belief system is based factually upon tradition as they twist and pervert the words of God's sacred tone to make it appear to line up with their traditional positions on everything from so-called faith alone, salvation, to the useless ordinance of elective water baptism, to the theology of God as three divine persons. I grew up being falsely taught among any number of other things that baptism in water is the quote, and this is from virtually any fundamentalist evangelical uh, church denomination, quote unquote, it is the outward evidence of an inward conversion. That is how they teach it. 
I was taught that water baptism is strictly voluntary and plays no role whatsoever in the conversion experience. According to my pastors and the denomination in which I was raised, those of the apostolic faith and even those within the Church of Christ and similar churches, because apostolics are not alone in teaching this, were wrong in teaching that baptism was an essential act of obedience prescribed by God himself to physically put feet on our faith and demonstrate our newfound faith in the atoning work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary as according to the Lord's brother James, quote, faith without works, action is dead being alone. End quote. If you ever want to see an example of someone going well out of their way to explain away the clear message of the Bible in favor of a pre-adopted theological position, watch fundamentalist preachers, believers, and theologians contort themselves to the point of insanity as they try to explain away the false message of elective baptism in exchange of the clear message found in such passages as Mark 16, 15, and 16, uh, uh, 15, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 16 and verse 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. Acts 2, 38, as well as verse 41. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Acts 2.41 states, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Then say they that gladly believed his word, uh, that received his word, believed. No. How did we know they believed? How did we know they received the gospel? Because they put feet on their faith and they went to the water to be baptized. In Acts 22, verses 12 through 16, we read as part of the Apostle Paul's conversion experience. And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there, came unto me, this is Paul speaking, and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. And the same hour I looked up upon him, and he said, The God of our fathers have chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will, and see that just one and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth for thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard listen and now why tarriest thou arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins calling on the name of the Lord Oh, you want to see fundamentalists twist themselves every which way? Just, just ask them about these scriptures that I'm sure. Oh, I'm not done. Acts chapter 8, verse 12. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. 
Acts 10 verses 44 through 48. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished. As many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. My God, they just received the Holy Ghost. Doesn't sound to me like baptism was an elective. <sighs> so I know I'm telling the truth. There are some people out there, you were born and raised in fundamentalist crap. And it doesn't matter what truth, doesn't matter what the Word of God says, you're going to believe the garbage you were taught. And you go to hell believing it because you'd prefer tradition over truth. And that is what is destroying our nation today. 1 Peter 3.21 The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. In other words, it's not about a physical cleansing, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's about being able to face God in the judgment and know that we've done what He asked us to do. In Romans 6, Beginning at verse 4, the Word of God said, Therefore, we are buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. One of the biggest words in the Word of God today is a little word, I-F. If, Paul writes in verse 5, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of His death. When are we planted together in the likeness of His death? And through baptism, that is what the act of baptism does. He said, if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the likeness of his, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ so if you have not been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus Christ my friend I got news for you you have not been baptized into Christ you can call yourself a Christian till your pimples pop. And I got news for you, honey. According to the Word of God, you have not satisfied the requirement of God. He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Faith alone is bunk. The Lord's brother James told us that in James chapter 2. He said, you tell me you got faith. He said, without your works, I'll show you my faith by my works. 
because faith without action is dead being alone. That is an eternal principle. So therefore God said, when you believe, here is the action I want you to take to demonstrate that you believe this gospel. I want you to be buried with me in baptism. But just ask a fundamentalist preacher, ask a fundamentalist theologian, ask a fundamentalist Christian about these half dozen or so scriptures that I've just read to you. Every one of them makes it abundantly clear that a baptism is not by any stretch of the imagination voluntary. It's not an elective. No. The New Testament church preached it as part of the born again experience. Why is it that everywhere the gospel was preached, immediately the people were called upon to be baptized or commanded to be baptized? And how were they told to be baptized? In the name of the Lord. And go ahead and ask your fundamentalist preacher about that too. Wait till you hear them twist and pervert and contort every single New Testament record of baptism being in the name of Jesus Christ. Go ahead and ask them about that because they'll bend over backwards till their back breaks trying to explain that away in light of Matthew 28, 19. Instead of trying to explain how those passages must surely somehow uh, come into harmony with Matthew 28, 19. But no, you'll hear every kind of, oh, fundamentals crack me up, some of the answers so give. Well, you know, the reason that the Peter preached at Pentecost that they should be baptized in the name of the Lord was because the Jews, the Jews needed to acknowledge Jesus as Messiah. Oh, really? Then why is it Peter commanded the house of Cornelius, a Roman soldier, Gentiles, after they had received the gift of the Holy Ghost, to be baptized in the name of the Lord? Your arguments are foolish. They're ignorant. They're idiotic. Some of you folks listening to me now, you've never even heard this preach. You've never even heard this talk. You've never even heard this talked about. But it's the Word of God. And you need to understand it and accept it as such. Not because I say so. Honey, go study the Bible. Go study. Listen, go look up what I'm telling you. I'm not afraid you're going to come back to me with some uh, different notion. Not if you go to the book, you won't. I spoke to a young Baptist man Years ago when I first started my progressive ministry, we had an outreach center in Brooklyn, New York, a Christian bookstore with a library facility and a coffee shop. And a young Baptist man came in and he and I spoke for quite a while and we got to talking about baptism. And I told him baptism is part of the New Testament born again experience. God has called us to respond to our faith in the gospel by going to the waters of baptism and being buried in his name, in his name, in his name. For there is no other name given among men under heaven by which we must, must, must be saved. Whosoever calleth upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Arise, Saul, and wash away thy sins. Calling upon what? The name of the Lord. Sounds like Jesus' name, baptism, to me. You know why fundamentalists are falling for, our, for the new fascist movement in America today because they have no genuine commitment to the Word of God and they never have. You see, this is where 
a lot of people look and they say, oh, I can't believe so many Christians. I can't believe evangelicals are falling into the deception. I can't believe they're buying into the con. I can't believe that their leaders are convincing them to support a wicked and evil man like Donald Trump. <laughs> really? You can't believe that? You know why you can't believe it? Because you mistakenly think that at one time, evangelicals and fundamentalists actually were committed to the Word of God. And I'm here to tell you, they never have been, never were, never will be. They are as feckless. What does feckless mean? It means they're without integrity. They're without honesty always have been folks they've always determined what they first want to believe and then twist scripture to make it try to sound like it supports what they want it to say they've been doing that since the beginning of their movement so what's happening today ought not to surprise you we saw it happen in Germany in the 1930s the fundamentalists, the Christians in Germany, oh, they fell right in with Hitler. They fell right in behind him. Why? For the same identical reasons that fundamentalists today are falling in behind Trump. They want to do away with democracy. Democracy does not serve us. Because in truth, we love to say we're the majority. But when an election suggests that we are in fact not the majority, we get all mad. We get upset. We claim it had to have been rigged. Why? Because we say we're the majority. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And if we say it, it must be true. I've been saying for years. I drove Uber for three years. I've known a lot of people in my life. I've talked to innumerable people. I've spoken to, I can't even count how many Republicans I've talked to. And they have said to me, I vote Republican for strictly, strictly for fiscal policy. That's it. I'll never forget one guy I drove an Uber. He was an airline pilot. And he said, I vote Republican strictly for, because of their uh, policy concerning, you know, money and taxes and spending. He said, that's it. He said, all that other culture war crap, all that other uh, conservative Christian crap, he said, I have no use for that at all. I could care less about that. Got news for you, my fundamentalist and evangelical friends. There are far more people who vote Republican who feel that way than you will ever know. The only rabid lunatics who want to fight culture wars, who want to come against abortion, want to come against gay lesbian people, want to come against all these things that they don't believe in. The only people in the Republican Party who feel that way are the most rabid fundamentalists and evangelicals. And I got news for you, honey. I know a lot of people in fundamentalist evangelical churches who don't feel that way either. So when you don't understand how it is that you folks can lose an election because your leaders have been lying to you and deceiving you, feckless leaders, leaders with no conscience, leaders who lie, leaders who are dishonest, leaders who have no integrity, when they get up and they lie to you and they tell you that strict Fundamentalist thinking believers make up the majority of people in this country. They are full of crap. I can't say it any other way. They are full of baloney. 
you better be careful about how you approach understanding the word of God you better be careful honey your salvation rests in a clear and truthful knowledge of God's plan of salvation you better be careful how you let tradition rule and reign in your theological world believer in Matthew 15, 1 through 9, then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Ye hypocrites! Well did Esaias prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me. In vain do they worship. There are churches today full of people worshiping in vain. What does that mean? means their worship avails nothing. It accomplishes nothing. And, and God doesn't even listen. He doesn't, he's not paying attention. Why? Because they're devoted to, to, to tradition, not to truth. Do you hear what I'm telling you? But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. In Mark 7, 1 through 9, then came together unto him the Pharisees and certain of the scribes which came from Jerusalem. And when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is to say, with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands oft, eat not holding the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not. And many other things there be, which they have received to hold, as the washing of cups and pots, brazen vessels, and of tables. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? He answered and said unto them, Well hath Esaias prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. How be it in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of of men for laying aside the commandment of God ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things ye do and he said unto them full will ye reject the commandment of God that ye may keep your own tradition the Jews listen listen to me children the Jews rejected the Lord Jesus Christ as their Messiah because he did not come to do as they had wanted him to do. He was not on an earthly mission to overthrow the shackles of Roman colonization, but rather to break the chains 
of sin and oppression. They preferred the man who had acted in a manner that was more in keeping with their own views of what a Messiah should look like. That man's name was Barabbas. See, Barabbas had led an insurrection. That's what they expected their Messiah to do. Oh, I'm going to tell you, when, if you think the story of Barabbas in Scripture is just some arbitrary story, oh, no, 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 no. Look who presented the Lord to the political leadership of their day. The morning after he was arrested, the word of God said, and straightway in the morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. Who delivered him to Pilate? The same people he had rebuked for embracing tradition over the truth of God's word. They were more interested in their own view and making God, listen to me children, making God concede to their viewpoint. Got news for you. I came to realize this many, many, many years ago. That's exactly what fundamentalism and what evangelicalism in America has been doing for decades. We have a view on abortion. Okay. So preach it in the church. Make sure that Christian women know that you don't believe a certain thing ought to be done a certain way. Oh, but no, we believe it's the responsibility of the church to exercise our political influence in the world. Really, because the Bible does not teach that. Nowhere in Scripture. Now, they'll twist and pervert and they'll try to tell you the Bible does in fact teach that. But I got news for you, it doesn't. Never has, never will. But the people who delivered the Lord up before Pilate are the same people he rebuked for their love of tradition over the truth of God. Am I telling the truth today? I know I am. Mm -hmm. And they chose a man over Jesus who was violent and murderous in his desire to overthrow the oppression of Rome. That's what they wanted. Got news for you folks. Christians in America today are supporting a wicked and evil man who would sell his own mother's bones if he thought he could make a buck. Who has openly uh, committed all kinds of grift in the White House who has used the presidency like no president in American history as a money-making machine and you idiots sat there the whole time and cheered him on and everything he did you justified. Why? Because he's your Barabbas. You choose him over Jesus any day of the week. Why? Because Jesus won't do things the way you want it done. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Do you hear what I'm telling you now, children? I choose Jesus. Amen. I choose Jesus. But let me tell you what Jesus had to say. Matthew 16, 21 through 23. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. 
But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. You don't want to do things God's way because it's too hard. You don't want to do things God's way because you don't like that path. You'd rather do them a way that suits your flesh better, that suits your carnal nature, that agrees with your worldly carnal mind more than God's spiritual way. I'm telling you, the Spirit of the Lord is speaking to the fundamentalist and evangelical world today. You savor us not the things that be of God but the things that be of men. In John chapter 18, verses 33 through 38, the Lord is standing before Pilate. Listen, then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee? of me. Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, Listen, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. He said, if, if I were merely the king of an earthly kingdom, then certainly my servants would fight to defend me and to deliver me from this setup job that the Jews are trying to inflict upon me. He said, but my kingdom is not of this world. But now is my kingdom not from hence, he said, but right now, my kingdom is not part of this society. It is not part of this world. It is not part of this structure. Verse 37, Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and said unto them, I find in him no fault at all. We have believers today who still do not understand my kingdom is not of this world. We are not called to fight battles in this life. We are not called to fight culture wars in this life. We are not called to fight political wars or to even seek to exercise political influence in this world. We are called to live the life. We are called to preach the gospel. We are called to be a light in a dark world, not by reason of our political muscle, but by reason of the brightness of the light of the life we live. A city that is set upon a hill cannot be hid. My God, how far the church has gone off track. In John chapter 18, verses 10 and 11, as the Lord was being arrested, then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not 
drink it. God's way is not always an easy way, but His people are called to submit and to yield to it because the spiritual yield is far more important than anything we might gain in this life. While the evangelical and fundamentalists for decades have been willing to sell their soul to support any candidate with an R behind his name, they have not cared, they have not thought, they have not considered. God showed this to me years ago. He said, every opportunity I've given them over and over again. Candidates have won the support of the Republican Party to run for president, the Lord said. And that candidate had the uh, capability of causing massive spiritual damage in our nation. What do you mean, Pastor? Fundamentalists and evangelicals jumped in behind Mitt Romney, a Mormon. Say, well, you know, I don't care that he's a Mormon. I do. I do. You know why? Because if he were elected president, all of a sudden the Mormon faith would get one of the biggest boosts it's ever gotten. And people would begin to look at it differently, and they would begin to see it differently. And with evangelical churches so hungry for power in political areas, endorsing this Mormon, they're going to be sending the false message around the world that Mormonism is every bit as legitimate a Christian faith as any other Christian faith. And honey, got news for you. It is anything but. It is a faith that is uh, possessed of doctrines of devils. But this is what evangelicals in America were willing to sell. This is what they were willing to trade for influence in this world. Do you see what I'm telling you? Got news for you. Donald Trump won the first test that the, the Lord allowed the church to experience in America. Oh, no, 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 no. There were others. And the church failed over and over and over again. They could care less about the spiritual ramifications. They were more worried about the temporal, earthly ramifications. They thought, well, if I defend the Lord with my sword, I can prevent him being arrested. And the Lord said, you don't want to do that. Because the spiritual ramifications of what I'm about to do are far more important than anything I'm about to go through over the next 24 hours. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. Those who choose to embrace carnality over spirituality, who prefer tradition over truth, will always side with the one who represents an earthly, worldly, sinful perspective, just as the Jews sided with Barabbas, chose Barabbas. But you know what's interesting? You notice in that primary text today, the Bible said that the leaders, the Jews, the priests and the elders, they were in the crowd, stirring the crowd up. Call out for Barabbas. Pick Barabbas. Choose Barabbas. Just like we got leaders in the evangelical world today saying, choose Trump, choose Trump, choose Trump. They're stirring up. Make the wrong choice. And the leaders... The leaders are calling for and stirring the congregation to make the wrong choices. And these people were foolish enough 
to allow themselves to be manipulated. These people, not a day before, were crying in the streets, Hosanna, blessed is he who cometh in the name of the Lord. And now, because their leadership has changed direction, so too have they. Oh, children, I'm here to tell you today, the fickle faith of feckless fundamentalists. They will happily abandon the precepts of Christ and the teachings of God's Word in favor of one who represents what they choose to believe. I've literally read, I'm almost done tonight, I've literally read several articles in the last few weeks about uh, evangelical leaders who are now starting to get a little bit worried because they're being approached by not one, not two, not a dozen, but by many, many, many pastors, Baptist pastors, evangelical pastors, who are telling them that when they read from the Sermon on the Mount, listen to me, members of their church came to them afterwards and said, where did you get all that liberal wool crap from? See how they've been conditioned? See how they've been brainwashed? See where their leaders have led them? Now, when they hear the precepts of Christ as they came from His very own mouth, they're rejecting it as hyper-liberal wokeism. They prefer what they hear coming out of Donald Trump than what they hear coming out of Jesus. Am I telling the truth today? Feckless fundamentalists have always been on the wrong side of history. And they will one day answer to God for their sin. Failure to walk in the Master's footsteps is grounds for rejection from the gates of glory. As unprofitable servants are rejected with those who have rejected the gospel altogether. We cannot afford today to be fickle in our faith. Nor do we dare approach our service of the Lord as feckless fundamentalists. Amen. 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 I told you this wasn't going to be an easy message, but it's a message that needed to be said. Amen. God's church needs to hear this. When you stand before the Lord in judgment and you find yourself condemned because you were more in love with tradition, you were more in love with believing what you wanted to believe and then trying to twist the scripture to make it support what you wanted it to say. When you find out that you had no love of the truth in you, but rather that you loved carnal worldly ways. You rejected the words of Christ over the words of a Barabbas because Barabbas did things the way you thought they ought to be done. Honey, you are not going to stand before God guiltless. He's going to point back to December the 10th, 2013 and say, oh, don't try to tell me you had no way of knowing any better. You heard that preacher. I put a word in his spirit to warn you, and you heard him. So now, honey, you are without excuse before God. And the rest of us, we're encouraged to stay with a spiritual mind. Amen. We're encouraged to continue to love the Word of God, to love the precepts of our Lord, to love His commandments and His teachings over the traditions of men, and to do things God's way, even when sometimes God's way isn't the easy way. 
because the eternal repercussions are far more important than any possible temporal comforts we may have gained. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen.